Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Now, um, as Julian mentioned, this is part, a talk part of the Festival of Ideas, and the theme for the Festival of Ideas this year is extremes. So what could be more extreme than the title of my book, Against Marriage? Um, and philo uh, publishers like extreme titles, um, so you might notice there's a much more constructive subtitle in much smaller letters underneath, which is um, an egalitarian defence of the marriage-free state. Um, and in the book, I do both things. Part one of the book is a critique of marriage, as the against marriage title suggests. And part two is a more constructive set of proposals for how the state should interact with and regulate personal relationships in place of marriage. Today, I'm mainly going to be talking about the first critical part but I'll gesture towards the constructive part and I'll be happy to take questions and say more about that later on if anyone would like to hear it. Okay, so to start then with a question against marriage, we need to know what is marriage? Now, when you think of marriage, you might think of all kinds of things. You might think of weddings, parties, dresses, celebrations, commitment, love, romance, family, stability. Now, you'll be pleased to know that I'm not going to be against those things in the talk and in the book. So my critique of marriage is not a critique of happiness, of parties, of stability, of love, and of romance. Instead, the uh, critique of my book is the state recognition of marriage. So it's an argument against the state recognition of marriage. Now, in order to know what uh, the argument against the state recognition of marriage might be, we need to know what state recognition of marriage is. Now, this here is a marriage certificate. So, when the state recognises marriage, one of the things it does is records who is married. And marriage certificates therefore become part of public record and open to inspection for anybody, by anybody. The royal family is exempt from that requirement to have their marriage certificates open to inspection, um, with the exception of this one. And this is the marriage certificate of Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles, which is available for public inspection because their marriage took place in a registry office. Now, I like this because it demonstrates not only the fact of the state recognition of marriage being a matter of public record, but it also demonstrates some of the patriarchal history of the institution, which I'll be talking about. So if you can see, let me see if this will work. Here we are. On the marriage certificate, here we have the um, name and surname of the, um, of the groom, of Prince Charles, um, His Royal Highness, and there's lots of names, Prince, George, Charles, lots and lots and lots of them. Um, and then you have his rank or profession. Here, this one up here. Prince of the United Kingdom. Um, I quite like that he's got Camilla's rank or profession here as uh, just blank, there isn't one. <laughs> But then even nicer than that, um, for my purposes, is that it then lists here the, um, the father's name and rank or profession of father. And the father's name, of course, is Prince Philip, and his rank or profession is Duke of Edinburgh. What's not listed on that marriage certificate is the mother's name or the mother's rank and profession, despite that being queen. <laughs> So this illustrates quite nicely for me the um, patriarchal history and tradition of state-recognised marriage. So what does the state do when it recognises marriage? Well, it does the three things listed at the bottom of that slide there. Firstly, the state is engaged in definition and control. So when the state recognises marriage, it defines what marriage is and who can be married. So, for example, it says whether or not marriage has to be a relationship between two people or whether it can be a relationship between more than two, whether they have to be one man and one woman or whether it can be people of the same sex. It defines whether marriage is something that's necessarily sexual, necessarily monogamous, necessarily permanent. So it defines the institution and it controls access to it. The second thing the state does when it recognises marriage is that it provides recognition and endorsement in the sense of giving approval. So when the state recognises marriage, it doesn't merely say, we notice that these people are married. It says, we support that, we endorse that, we give them recognition in that fuller ethical sense. The state of being marriage, married is a state that we, the state and the citizenry generally, as a understood as a collectivity, support and endorse. So it makes that declaration of marriage as being a situation to be supported. And the third thing the state does when it recognises marriage is it gives legal rights and duties to the people who marry because they're married. 
Now, those legal rights and duties, of course, vary according to the particular state we're talking about. Um, but they may well include rights and duties relating to matters such as um, tax breaks, um, identification of next of kin. They might well involve rights um, over, over children that the couple may have. And typically, the rights and duties that come with marriage are significantly those relating to divorce and separation. And I include that package of legal rights and duties, including the rights and duties that come with divorce, as being part of that state-recognised condition of being married. So my claim is as follows, that no matter how marriage is reformed, no matter how a particular state defines marriage, whether we introduce or recognise same-sex couples, whether we expand marriage in different ways, the state recognition of marriage necessarily undermines both equality and liberty. And I'm going to argue that it necessarily undermines equality, potentially in a variety of ways. Most traditionally, as we've seen, state recognised marriage is based on inequality on grounds of sex and also on grounds of sexuality. But it also can instantiate inequality on grounds of race, religion and culture. But that no matter how we reform it, state-recognised marriage creates an inequality between married and unmarried people generally and between the children of married people and unmarried people. I'm also going to argue that state-recognised marriage undermines liberty in the sense that the state recognising marriage necessarily involves the state in taking a position on these controversial questions of meaning, questions that interact with and conflict with many people's deeply held convictions and that the state taking a position on those undermines the idea that in a liberal society we should be free to make those decisions and judgments for ourselves. In my view, the equality argument is the strongest, but I'll present both of them for you tonight. Okay, so let's start with equality. This is the full image from the cover of the book. It's a painting by um, Vasily Pukarev called The Unequal Marriage. And in it you can see the traditional feminist critique of marriage. So in this painting we have the, the bride here, this young woman who is offering up her hand to get married. In one sense she's offering it, in another sense we're clearly meant to get the impression that she's submitting under some sort of duress or sense of obligation. She's not fully willing. Her eyes are red, she's been crying and she's marrying this person here the older man with medals, who is clearly much more powerful than her in terms of age and status. And we're invited to join in with this person here who looks towards us, sharing his disapproval of this unequal marriage. Um, and this person here is a self-portrait of the artist, also giving us his disapproval of this unequal marriage. And this shows, as I say, the classic feminist critique of marriage, which is that it's an institution that has been used to to bolster, create, and reflect the inequality of women and men. And the feminist critique of marriage, in this sense, is many um, decades and centuries old. Now, this critique has what I would think of as two parts, that marriage oppresses women both practically, and in a moment, I'll talk about how it oppresses women symbolically, according to this critique. Now, the two people here are two of the feminists who have criticised marriage for being oppressive to women, um, John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor. And they were among the many feminists who criticised the system of coverture according to which women's rights were lost on marriage. So when Mill was writing in the 19th century, um, in England, women lost pretty much all of their legal rights on marriage. They, they ceded their property to their husbands. They did not have legal control or custody of their children. They were under a legal duty to obey their husbands. They were also not permitted to vote, and divorce was practically um, impossible. And rape within marriage was not recognised as a crime. So that whole package of legal inequalities led Mill to describe marriage as the primitive state of slavery lasting on. And I think it's quite easy to see how that critique really makes an effective position when that legal inequality is so profound. But of course you might be thinking now that legal inequality doesn't persist. Those inequalities that uh, John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor were critiquing have all been reformed. Now, some of those reforms are very recent. So rape did not become a crime within marriage um, in England and Wales until 1991. That's very recent, some 100 years after Mill was writing. But nevertheless, we have equality between women and men within marriage now. So is marriage still unequal 
Is it still oppressive to women in this practical sense? Well, I would argue that in some senses, yes, it still is. And the inequalities that women suffer in marriage now are more related to sociological and social facts rather than to legal oppression. There's various interesting social science research that connects the condition of being married to various situations of inequality for women. Marriage generally tends to reinforce the gender division of labour, the idea that women should be primarily responsible for housework and childcare, whereas men are primarily responsible for breadwinning. And that gender division of labour in itself connects to various other forms of inequality, women's financial in, um, dependence on men, women's the gender pay gap and other phenomena of that kind. There's also interesting social science research that shows that social norms connected to marriage lead married men and women, when it's a different sex marriage, to perform various tasks in a very unequal way. So, for example, a sociological research on housework says that married women do the most housework of any other type of person, including cohabiting women, and that, un that married men do the least of all. So there's something about marriage that makes people fit into gendered um, roles in that way. But feminists also argue that marriage oppresses women symbolically. Now here's Bridget Jones, those of you um, who know who this is, the fictional heroine whose main sort of narrative role is to be a woman in her 30s who is unmarried and to be pitiable for that and to have a you know, genuine source of angst and crisis about the situation of being unmarried in her 30s. And so feminists will say, well, look, the situation whereby marriage is upheld as the pinnacle of women's lives and women's success is also oppressive to women. Women are held up as unfailing if they're unmarried. And the thought here is that we ought to worry about the situation of being unmarried. Women should fear being a spinster, whereas men should not fear being a bachelor. That has a different kind of connotation. And so that idea that state recognition gives marriage as the pinnacle of, of life for women, falls again unequally on women and is oppressive to them. Now I think quite a nice illustration of this comes if you do a Google image search, as I did um, just a couple of days ago, on the phrase single woman. Um, what you get is a lot of women staring into the middle distance over drinks or phones or whatever. Here we are, like this, <laughs> this one. Another one, people in the background, um, yeah, middle distance, the bed, the drinks, the couple. Um, yeah, they go on and on. That's the last one. So the thought here is that marriage, you know, holding up this idea of marriage as the ultimate aim for women is oppressive to women. Another example I like of this is this book, um, the Rules, the popular self-help uh, self best-selling book from the 90s, which has been republished many times since then, including updates for online dating. Um, and the premise of The Rules is it tells women how to get a husband um, by basically being passive in various ways, by not getting angry, never telephoning men, never saying what their sexual needs are. It's about kind of the, the passivity norm. And if you read The Rules, you might think, well, you know, I don't think I need to do any of that stuff. This isn't for me. Uh, and the authors have a real, you know, telling off for people like that. They say, if you think you're too smart for the rules, ask yourself, am I married? <laughs> if not, why not? Could it be that something you're doing isn't working? Think about it. <laughs> so again, the impression very much is, you know, you should be married, you ought to be married. If you're not married, there's something wrong. And this general package of uh, sort of social expectations is an oppressive force for women. But feminists have also argued that marriage is heterosexist, that it's oppressive to lesbian and gay people. And again, this criticism of marriage um, comes in both practical and symbolic forms. So on the practical side, if same-sex marriage is not recognised by the state, if the only people who can marry are different-sex couples, then lesbian and gay people cannot access the legal rights and protections of marriage, they cannot access all that practical assistance that comes with marriage, and that results in an inequality and an oppression. We see in this protest slide, separate is not equal, the legal rights and duties must come with it as well. <laughs> 
And this vulnerability that is suffered by people in same-sex ma- um, relationships who cannot access marriage is, I'm going to argue, also a real problem with marriage, however it's reformed, because the vulnerability that comes from not being able to access those legal rights and duties and protections applies to anybody who's not married and is in that relationship of vulnerability. So, feminists and queer theorists and lesbian and gay activists have argued that traditional marriage, which doesn't recognise same-sex marriage, is heterosexist practically, and it's also heterosexist symbolically. As this slide shows... Um, it's possible to think of a situation in which the same legal rights and duties are given to people in same-sex relationships, perhaps via civil partnership. But if people in same-sex relationships can't access marriage, they can't access that special form of state recognition, that approval, that status, that is upheld as being particularly important. As this um, protest sign shows, I didn't ask her to civil union me. And so from this point of view, um, feminists and other egalitarian theorists have argued that traditional marriage, which isn't open to same-sex couples, is oppressive to lesbian and gay people, even if they don't want to get married themselves, because it's this denial of state recognition. Now, you might think that these two uh, critiques of marriage look contradictory. So the critique that says, well, marriage is oppressive to women looks like a critique that says that it's bad to be married. Whereas the critique that says marriage is heterosexist looks like a critique that says it's good to be married. And I think we can reconcile these by understanding that the claim here is that insofar as marriage exists, then it's a bad thing to be excluded from it. And that's compatible with the idea that the state recognition of marriage is in itself um, a bad thing. And so this gets us what I call the basic claim for same-sex marriage. So the basic claim for same-sex marriage says, if different sex marriage is recognised by the state, then the principle of equal rights requires the recognition of same-sex marriage. So it's a conditional claim. That basic claim is consistent with there being no state-recognised marriage, but it's a claim of, as it were, mere equality. All we need is equal rights to get us the need for the recognition of same-sex marriage. Now, this um, basic claim is a claim that I fully support from a political point of view. I think, politically speaking, it's absolutely correct, and I think the move from the recognition of only different-sex marriage to the recognition of same-sex marriage has been a necessary and an important progressive step. So, politically, I fully support this basic claim. But philosophically, it's a bit different. Because this basic claim looks very simple. But the purpose of philosophy, or one purpose of philosophy, is to take things that look obvious, that look simple, and make them difficult and complicated. And sure enough, this is no exception. Because the basic claim, in a philosophical sense, needs more to to work. Because you could respond in the following way. You could say, well, if we only recognise... Um, different sex marriage. We have traditional conception of marriage with same-sex relationships excluded. Everybody does have an equal right to marriage. Everybody has the equal same right to marry somebody of a different sex. And some theorists have argued in that way. But of course that argument misses the point that is meant by people who argue in favour of same-sex marriage. Because to say, well, everybody has an equal right, you have the equal right to marry somebody of a different sex, misses what is valuable about marriage. After all, we can make the same claim about equal rights if we think about any other forms of historic discrimination. If we think about the situation in the United States before the Supreme Court ruling in Loving versus Virginia, which said states were no longer allowed to ban interracial marriage. Before that ruling, you could have said everyone has the equal right to marriage, You just have to marry somebody of the same race. But that really doesn't get the meaning of equal rights right. It doesn't get the value of marriage right. So in order to make this basic claim, we need a bit more. We need to say what it is that the right to marry is all about. What is it that is valuable about being married that is not captured in the equal right to marry somebody of a different sex? What else is it? What does marriage mean? So we need to investigate this basic claim. Equal rights to what? And there are various different 
answers to that question of what marriage really is. Some answers are on this slide. Marriage is really about equal protection under the law, or marriage is really about love, or marriage is really about commitment or family. These are different sorts of answers to the question of what marriage really means and what the value of the right to marriage must protect. And I suppose in recent um, years, the dominant understanding of what is at value in terms of the right to marry, which has really underpinned the movement for um, equal marriage understood as the recognition of same-sex marriage, is that marriage really is about respecting the right of people to marry for love. Now that can lead to arguments that there's a slippery slope here. So various theorists have argued, well, if um, marriage is about protecting your right to marry anybody that you love, does that mean that you should have the right to engage in polygamous marriages? Does that mean you should have the right to marry um, somebody who's related to you if you're both consensual? Does it lead even to, to bestiality? And you have these kind of slippery slope <coughs> arguments. <clears throat> Now, I'm not going to um, talk here about you know, what the answer is to what the value of marriage is. But one thing I will say is that any argument for the equal basic claim has to answer that question. Because it has to say what it is that marriage means and therefore what it is that marriage is protecting. And that leads me on to the second part of my critique, the idea that the state recognition of marriage is undermining of liberty because it involves the state taking a position on these controversial questions of what marriage is, what it means, and what relationships should be supported. So if the state is going to take a, a stance on what marriage means, it's going to have to fail to be what might be called neutral between these different understandings. It's going to have to take a controversial stance. And if it takes that controversial stance, it's necessarily going to clash with some deeply held convictions. Now this idea of um, the state taking a position on meaning is often contested. So this protester asks us, tell me again, exactly how is my marriage affecting you? And this, I think, is a common theme amongst advocates of same-sex marriage. The claim here is, you know, if you're against same-sex marriage, just don't have one. Right? There's no sense in which it affects you. And I think that that response, again, while it's appealing politically, is not quite right. Because... The definition of marriage that the state endorses does affect everyone, regardless of whether or not they have the kind of marriage that the state is endorsing. So under a situation where the state recognises traditional marriage only, different sex marriage only, the state is making a statement on behalf of the, um, the polity as a whole that Different sex relationships are uniquely special. The different sex monogamous relationships have a particular status. They're, they're special in a way that no other relationship is. When the state moves then to recognizing same sex relationships as well, it changes the meaning of that statement. Now the state is no longer saying there's something uniquely special about different sex relationships. Now it's simply saying different sex relationships are one amongst many kinds of relationships that are valuable. Now that, then, is a claim that is going to come up very strongly in contradiction to some deeply held understandings of marriage. Traditionalists will reject that, what they will think of as redefinition. Here on this slide we have some examples of traditionalist religious objections to same-sex marriage, with the idea here being that marriage is designed by God and that the state recognising same-sex marriage is conflicting with that. And we find this kind of example in, uh, for example, a statement made by the um, president and vice president of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of England and Wales against same-sex marriage. They wrote in, a, in an open statement, the roots of the institution of marriage lie in our nature. Male and female we have been created and written into our nature is this pattern of complementarity and fertility. Neither the church nor the state has the power to change this fundamental understanding of marriage itself, nor is this simply a matter of public opinion. So for these Catholic bishops, to use the term marriage to apply to same-sex relationships is a fundamental contravention of what they understand to be the God-given meaning of the institution. <clears throat> 
And of course, feminists and egalitarians welcome that redefinition. That's part of what leads feminists to endorse the recognition of same-sex marriage, not merely the extension of rights to same-sex couples, but also the idea that recognizing same-sex marriage will help to redefine the institution to take it away from its patriarchal history. So that redefinition is recognized and advocated by feminists. Still others worry that endorsing same-sex marriage is actually not necessarily a good move for um, lesbian people, gay people, bisexual people, queer people in general. For example, Judith Butler argues that the recognition of same-sex marriage um, contributes to the normalization, the demands that lesbian and gay people should become like straight people in order to be accepted. And she worries that using the state to encourage that is again part of this kind of uh, oppressive structure requiring people to conform in a certain way. Sheila Jeffries also argues in the same way. She argues that when lesbians and gay men demand marriage, they shore up a foundational practice of male dominance. And Jack Halberstam, who wrote the book On the Right here, similarly argues that marriage is an agenda forced upon LGBT groups by the inequality of the law, but it's not at the heart of, um, sort of queer activism. As Halberstam puts it, marriage flattens out the varied terrain of queer social life and reduces the differences that make queers, well, queer, to legal distinctions that can be ironed out by the strong hand of the law. So we return to this person's question. Tell me again, exactly how is my marriage affecting you? And the answer is, because what the state does when it recognizes marriage is it takes a position on controversial questions of meaning, of hierarchy, of status, which necessarily conflict with a whole variety of understandings that exist within a diverse society. The second problem with the state recognition of marriage is that however it's reformed, it necessarily creates a hierarchy between those relationships that are recognized as being appropriately marital and those which are not. Even if marriage is reformed so as to include same-sex couples, marriage necessarily distinguishes between married and unmarried people and married and unmarried relationship and family forms. Now on the slide here, we have some examples of different family forms that aren't focused on marriage. We have single parent families, we have polyamorous families, we have this one here is um, two twin sisters who live in San Francisco and famously have all their meals together in identical clothes in the same restaurants. So they live together as sisters. Um, and one of the only single women who is culturally known for being happy single, uh, Samantha from Sex and the City. And the idea here is that all these different family forms are, come as an afterthought under the state recognition of marriage. And what that does is gets you a hierarchy between the idea that some kinds of relationships should be recognized and endorsed and others should be thought of as an afterthought, a second best, or as not really recognized in any sense at all. Now you see this hierarchy that's part of the state recognition of marriage. When you think about the debate when same-sex marriage was legalized here as to whether it should be possible for different sex couples to have a civil partnership. Now you probably know that the Supreme Court has just ruled um, that, it, that the government must legislate so as to recognize same-sex marriage. Theresa May has announced that the government will be legislating in response to that Supreme Court ruling from a case brought by um, Rebecca Steinfeld and Charles Kaiden who wanted to have a, same, a different sex civil partnership. <laughs> But when same-sex marriage was legalized and debated in Parliament, some MPs wanted that provision to be brought in then. And David Cameron, who was Prime Minister at the time, was strongly against it. And I'm just going to read you what he said in Parliament, which shows you this idea that marriage is still held up as being a special form of relationship. Okay, so he said in Parliament, Frankly, I am a marriage man. I am a great supporter of marriage. I want to promote marriage, defend marriage, encourage marriage, and the great thing about last night's vote um, to recognize same-sex marriage is that two gay people who love each other will now be able to get married. That is an important advance. We should be promoting marriage rather than looking at any other way of weakening it. 
So David Cameron regarded allowing different sex couples to have a civil partnership as weakening marriage because it undermines the idea that marriage is the uniquely important form of relationship. I don't know if you noticed that rather um, interesting comment in that bit of his comments that I just read out. We shouldn't be looking at any other way of weakening it, suggesting that same-sex marriage is a way of weakening it. I don't know that that's what he intended to say, but that's certainly what he did say. And this stigmatisation then of non-married relationships can intersect with other inequalities such as race and class. So patterns of marriage um, differ by race and class with some social groups more likely to marry than others. And so stigmatisation of the non-married family as being the less valuable or less stable or less committed family can intersect with other forms of inequality as well. Okay. Now, the, the third way that marriage, um, state-recognised marriage undermines liberty, and the last way I'm going to talk about in this um, part of the talk, is what I call bundling. So when the state recognises marriage, it gives married people a bundle of rights and duties that come together all as a package, simply because the people are married. And what it bundles together is rights and duties relating to different relationship practices. Now, relationship practices are the different sorts of things that people engage in in relationships, as demonstrated by some of the pictures on this slide. So relationship practices include um, parenting, for example, or cohabiting together, or being financially dependent on each other, or engaging in caring relationships for each other and becoming each other's next of kin, um, and also possibly migration and moving around together. And what state-recognised marriage typically does is it gives the married couple a bundle of rights and duties relating to all those different kinds of practices, regardless of whether the married couple does in fact have children together or cohabit or are financially dependent on each other. And the problem with that is that the more different kinds of relationship practices are bundled together in marriage, the more the state is giving the sense that the right way to organise your relationship is by bundling those practices together. Now, this is not to say there's anything wrong with bundling. Many people do centralise their relationship practices within one important relationship, and that's not in any sense a, a bad thing. But it's not by any means the only way or even the dominant way that people organise their relationships in contemporary societies. A great many people have children without being married or have children within marriage and then separate so that they are co-parenting with somebody with whom they are not cohabiting and are not financially dependent. They might have caring responsibilities for elderly relatives. They might have um, migration, family reunion issues between siblings and so on. So a regulation on the basis of marriage that bundles together these different forms of relationship practices gives the impression that there's only one way of organising your family and also doesn't adequately cater for the large number of people who don't organise all of their relationship practices through one central relationship. Okay, so this is the, 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 uh, the penultimate slide for this part of the talk. So what do I suggest instead? What's the alternative, the marriage-free state? Well, we could get rid of the state recognition of marriage. But I don't argue that we should make being married illegal. I don't argue that people shouldn't be allowed to have their weddings, their parties, their ceremonies, religious or secular. So marriage in the marriage-free state, as I set it out, would still be permitted but it would have no legal status. So you could still have a religious ceremony of marriage or a secular one. That would be absolutely fine. But nevertheless, that lack of legal status for marriage doesn't mean that the state should be purely um, step out, should purely step out of the arena of personal relationships. Because personal relationships do still need regulation. Why? Well, because firstly, there are some matters that simply have to be determinant in law. We need to know um, who owns this property. We need to know who has parental responsibility for this child. We need to know if there is separation, does anybody owe anybody else any money? So there's some things that the state needs to have a clear answer to in law. But also, personal relationships can be areas of vulnerability. And so the state needs to regulate so as to protect people from vulnerability. And one of the main 
uh, worries in this area is that regulating via the assumption of marriage leaves unmarried people very vulnerable. So under the marriage free state, regulation of personal relationships still exists, but it tracks relationship practices, not relationship status. So if you're engaging in a relationship practice that requires regulation, then those regulations will apply to you, regardless of whether you're married or not. Practices then, under my proposals, are regulated piecemeal, not holistically. They're regulated one by one. There's no assumption that you're engaging in a bundle of relationship practices with one primary person. So instead, there will be relationship, uh, sorry, regulations that apply, say, to parenting, which apply to anybody who's a parent. There'll be other rela uh, regulations that apply to financial dependence, that apply to anybody who's in a relationship of financial dependence, and so on. So these regulations are piecemeal, not holistic, not bundled together. <coughs> what I call private marriage, which is to say those marriages that still take place, whether they are religious marriages or secular marriages, they're still permitted. They may still be subject to state regulation if that is necessary to prevent harm or oppression. So for example, there would still be a legitimate state interest in preventing child marriage, even if there's no legal status sought for that child marriage, because we know that child marriage is associated with um, oppression of children. So there's still a role for the state to get involved in regulating private marriages to prevent um, oppression and harm. But the state will not regulate private marriages so, to, so as to preserve any particular meaning of marriage. If you want to have a wedding ceremony where you marry your car, you know, the state's not going to get involved in that. That's completely up to you. It would be like friendship. So you might declare that somebody is your spouse, whether people find that an appropriate or realistic view of your relationship. You know, it's like friendship. I could call you my friend if I see you every day and phone you about everything. I could call you my friend if I've just um, clicked yes on Facebook. So it's like friendship. It doesn't have a state-recognized meaning. Now, it's easy here to get, I think, distracted by dilemmas of regulatory content. What should the law be that applies to cohabitation? What should the law be that applies to financial dependence? And I don't... Um, pretend or attempt in my book to answer those questions. Every area of law has its own enormous public policy and philosophical debates. And each area of law could be many books in and of itself. My proposals are a proposal based on regulatory form rather than content. So to help you identify this, I'm going to leave you with a kind of thought experiment, which is... Oh, I'm sorry it's overlapped. How's that happened? Okay, so what do you think um, is the ideal way for personal relationships to be regulated now in a marriage regime? How do you think the state should deal with unmarried parents, unmarried um, cohabitants, unmarried migrants, people who want to be next of kin but are unmarried, property owners, dependents, and so on? We will all have different answers to those questions. But your answer to those questions, what you think is the absolutely most just and fair way of the state dealing with those people in a marriage regime, would, in your ideal version of the marriage-free state, be applied to everybody, regardless of marital status. And that's the structure that I propose. Now, I'm going to um, stop there and open for questions, but I'm just going to leave you one little slide to look at where you think of some questions, which is this question, whether we can um, have any defence of marriage. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Claire, for a fantastic talk. I mean, you've opened up so many interesting areas for discussion. Uh, there's been a, a few things out there on Twitter raising a few questions. Um, and if there are people who are following this who would like to raise things, use the hashtag against marriage, and I'll try and keep an eye out, see if there are any questions, thoughts or comments people want to feed in. But we'll start off with any thoughts, questions or comments uh, from within the room. We have people with microphones. And if you could wait until the microphone gets to you before speaking, that would be fantastic. We'll start off over here. Hello. Hi. This Working? Good? Okay. Um, hi. Thank you very much. It was fantastic. And I, I agreed with a lot of the things that you um, said. Um, I was think 
so I, I studied um, family law last year, and this, these sorts of discussions came up a lot. And I, and I very much found myself um, in agreement with your stance on it. Uh, another thing that comes up a lot is um, the sort of other end of the relationship, as it were, uh, in divorce. Mm. And um, our current legal regime for divorce um, is that uh, you still have to prove fault on the part of your partner. Um, and that partner can contest that. And if they're successful in court, um, you... And, and, and they win the case, you won't be divorced. Um, with the result that uh, recently you may have seen in the Owens and Owens case, um, it was taken to a uh, Supreme Court decision. Um, the, uh, a wife um, went always to Supreme Court to, to get a divorce and still wasn't granted one. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that um, another aspect of marriage that is um, problematic is that it traps people in these relationships that they are not then able to get out of um, voluntarily and have to go through this legal process to get out of. And that's another problem with it. Sorry for a long-winded question or comment. Thank you. Do you want to answer to each go person? For it, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, I mean, this question of divorce and whether the state should have a uh, position on whether you remain married is also, obviously, as you say, uh, you said, okay? <laughs> uh, very, um, very significant. I mean, under my proposals, the, the state doesn't get involved in saying whether you are in, you know, a relationship at all. So it's not the adjudicator on, on that question. It simply has to adjudicate in questions of dispute whether a practice is continuing or, or separating. So, yes, I, I, I endorse your, your position. Thank you. There's uh, one at the back, uh, and then we'll come over to this side over here, and then a bit further forward there. Could it not be argued that your proposal actually limits liberty? Because right now you can opt out of state intervention by simply not marrying, but under your proposal every single couple would have their relationship regulated whether they wanted that or not. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so it's very important to provide for that um, that liberty, as you put it. And you're right that at the moment, the way you avoid regulation is by opting out of marriage or civil partnership, by failing to enter into that, um, that relationship. The problem with that situation at present is that that leaves people who are not married vulnerable, and it leaves them vulnerable not necessarily in a way that they have consciously endorsed and taken on. So research tends to show that typically if you ask people um, in England and Wales, which is the relevant jurisdiction um, for family law, Scotland has its different family law, um, whether they think there is such a thing as um, common law marriage. Most people think there is. Most people think that if you live with somebody as if married for a certain period of time, you get the same rights and duties as if you were married. In fact, that's not true. Um, there is no recognition of common law marriage and no situation of that kind under English and Welsh family law. So what you have is a situation whereby people who are engaged in what look like identically identical to married relationships, which may involve, for example, financial dependence, if you think of a traditional gendered division of labour, whereby a woman um, doesn't work outside the home but focuses on childcare and domestic work at the expense of breadwinning, then that woman, if she's not married, is going to be extremely vulnerable on separation because she will have no legal rights to property. So that's the kind of problem with re regulation via marriage. How do you secure liberty in my proposals? Well, the answer to that is you secure liberty by allowing people to opt out rather than requiring them to opt in. So I think there are some regulatory uh, structures, some relationship practices where you shouldn't be able to opt out of rights and duties. Um, uh, duties to children are the most obvious example. You shouldn't simply be able to opt out of duties to support children or something of that kind. But there may be other kinds of relationship practices where we think, look, there's reasonable diversity in how people arrange their lives. If you want to engage in a long-term relationship with a person but have no financial obligations to them or from them, then the position there should be that the, that couple should both opt out of regulation. They should both as well, sign a contract or an agreement saying they wish to opt out of state protection. And that would protect people more effectively because it wouldn't leave anybody vulnerable because they hadn't realised they needed to get married, because they wanted to marry but their partner refused to marry them or anything of that kind. So opting out um, to, for, for liberty rather than having to opt in to get protection. That's the, that's the thought. Thank you. So there's a question at the front here and then I think the third row over there. <laughs> 
you. Um, following from the previous question, yeah. um, uh, you suggested in your vision for a, a marriage-free state that uh, legislation would uh, follow practice. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't there be a problem of, well, basically creating a bonanza for lawyers? Uh, because there would be a better no, of, of proof on uh, well, proving that somebody has lived in a certain kind of relationship and that, that, that would create more problems that we could pot potentially solve. Thank you very much. So, um, the bonanza for lawyers. Well, the first thing to say is that the under my proposals, the state doesn't have to do anything that it doesn't already have to do under a marriage regime. Which is to say, under a marriage regime, the state still has to decide what it's going to do and how it's going to regulate unmarried people who, for example, are cohabitants or financial dependents or whatever. It still has to do something about those people. Um, problematically, in many cases, what the state does for those people is simply to fail to provide adequate protection, but it still has to do something. So the, the marriage-free state, as I set it out, doesn't create any new legislative problems that don't already exist. It simply says, remember these people who aren't married, you need to um, work out what to do for those people. Now, whether that then creates a bonanza for lawyers, I think it shouldn't do in the way that you are concerned about, because the state doesn't have to provide a ruling on whether a, two people are in a relationship, for example. Um, all it has to do is, if there is a dispute, so only in cases of dispute about some particular issue, only then does it have to provide a, a judgment on whether those two people are engaged in a particular relationship practice that comes under the law. And well-designed law should give a clear definition of what, it count, what counts as, being, uh, as doing that relationship practice. So we only have regulations for relationship practices where that regulation is needed. And so we have to have a clear public interest reason for that legislation and then a clear definition of who it applies to. So it doesn't have to look at all of us and make a judgment about whether or not we count as being in a relationship with every other person that we encounter. Thank you. So the one in the third row here, and we will come back. Then. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, one question for me is why you argue that marriage uh, the way it is now cannot be reformed. So I think that if we look at the historical trajectory of marriage, we see that there has been, from a progressive point of view, a lot of improvements, for example, in Germany or in Australia and other countries. And it seems that there are steps that take away most of the inequalities associated with marriage, potentially with the one exception between married couples and non-married couples. Um, and then may, one could potentially argue that there is a legitimate interest in protecting chosen permanent unions um, for that specific reason, that they are chosen and permanent, um, and that that may have benefits, for example, for childbearing, etc. Thank you. So, um, sorry, I was making a note. Okay, so the first thing to say is that you know, I don't have a, a crystal ball about what the effects of the recent reforms on the institution of marriage will be long term. So, um, as I raised in the middle of the talk, there are some people who think that the recognition of same-sex marriage will have a profoundly, uh, radically unsettling effect and that marriage will lose its oppressive meaning and that that's, that will be the sort of effects of that. And there are other theorists who are concerned about that and think that actually all you get there is the idea that in order to be accepted, people have to be married and you get sort of entrenchment of, of social norms. And I have no crystal ball to know which of those will come about. Um, I could imagine you know, either coming about and I have no predictive um, superiority. But I think it is important when you say that the inequality that cannot be reformed away is that inequality between married and unmarried people. And that is something that is at the core of my argument, that that cannot be um, avoided. Now, when you said at the end, well, there might be a legitimate interest in protecting stable families or stable relationships or chosen relationships, there are various different justifications for the state recognition of marriage that are offered along these lines. The problem is that they are almost always protecting something other than marriage. So, of course, 
we can all think of celebrity marriages that lasted only a few hours. We can all think of people who were not married, but who are together for decades. So stability and marriage aren't the same thing. Similarly, if we think about the need to protect stability with, uh, for, for children, then parenthood is not the same as marriage. There's always going to be unmarried parents because we can never prevent the death of a parent or accidental pregnancy. There will always be parents who are not married, no matter what we might uh, do to try and prevent that. So what we ought to be doing, I think, is to protect those aspects of relationships that genuinely we do have a state interest in protecting, stability, uh, commitment, but those things are not the same as marriage. Marriage is a proxy and, and, and uh, an imprecise proxy for those things. Yeah. Okay, we'll take this question uh, and then we'll go up to the top there and then come down to you. And then I see the others up here as well. So. My question is in some ways very similar to the one that was asked over there uh, and um, I thought I would raise it anyway because I'm less worried about bonanza for lawyers, I am a lawyer, uh, than <laughs> about the uh, capacity for government intrusion into people's lives that is inherent in the idea that you look at relationship practice rather than relationship status. Um, if I may give you an example um, from immigration practice, um, if somebody from outside Europe who with some difficulty has got uh, to live in Britain wants to bring in a partner or wants to confer that right to remain on a partner, um, at the moment the powers that be do not look simply at the question whether they are married. They actually look at the genuineness of the relationship and in order to do so they put both parties through an incredibly intrusive process of questioning and interviewing and checking and so on. Whereas if they were able to simply say here is our marriage certificate, we are legally married and that would end the matter, it would save a lot of the heartache. Thank you, yes. So I think that this is perhaps a question again of um, regulatory content rather than form. So we're all going to have different views, for example, about immigration. Right? Some people in this room might think that there should be completely open borders with no immigration restrictions of any kind. Some people in this room might think there should be almost no immigration, very, very restricted. Other people will have views in between. Now, I would question in that situation, I would say there doesn't, to me, seem to be an adequate grounding for allowing um, immigration on the basis of a proven relationship of the kind that you set out. That I would agree with you that that is a deeply problematic sort of invasion into privacy. I would think that the right solution to that would be to say something like, if we're going to have restrictions on immigration, allow every person to bring in one person of their choice. We're going to have different views on that question, whether that's the right solution to immigration or not. But we should only, my proposals only require that kind of very, very intrusive invasion into people's lives if we end up thinking that there's a legitimate form of state regulation that requires that. Um, so I don't think that's the case with immigration. And if you think there is another case, we could think about that as being different. Thank you. Go right to the top there, and then down here, and then there are there. There. As someone who's been married and divorced three times, I strongly support your uh, argument. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask, don't you consider marriage fundamentally to be about money and free labor, and wouldn't a, more, a faster and more radical way to get rid of marriage, rather than just abstractly saying to abolish it, would be to demand pay? for women, for their housework and their childcare, and wouldn't that fundamentally change the idea of marriage? Thank you so much. So yes, um, the, the kind of claim that women should have wages for childcare, wages for housework is a kind of radical feminist claim that I have a lot of sympathy for. My suggestion is not that um, ending the state recognition of marriage is enough to end you know, inequality between women and men. So there's many other things that need to be, to be done. So my thought here is not that that um, the marriage free state is adequate to providing sex equality, but that it's a sort of necessary part of it because in recognizing marriage, the state is actively participating in that process, but it's not all that has to be done. Yeah, thanks. Okay, and the question there. Thanks very much. Uh, I came, ex I'm over here to your right. 
Yep. Ah, Hi thank there. you. I came expecting to disagree um, with a number of points, and I wasn't disappointed, but I think the, the value of this is learning to disagree better. Um, so thank you for a stimulating presentation. I'm interested in the big picture of human flourishing that lies behind your presentation, and in particular, whether it's based on um, the autonomous individual, um, quite freely sort of negotiating life with minimal constraints, um, and whether that informs the way we talk about it. For instance, rights have come up a lot, rights to equality, rights to liberty, um, responsibilities. Duty, you did mention duty several times, but responsibility has played sort of second fiddle, I think, to rights. Um, I think you're hard pressed to find a more challenging, existentially challenging um, document than sort of the, the, the vows for marriage in the Book of Common Prayer. They, yeah, they are scary. Um, <laughs> So I, um, I guess I'm, my question to you is, is what's the big picture for human flourishing um, and how does responsibility sort of figure in your thinking on marriage? Thank you. That's not a small question, is it? How, what is my general theory of human flourishing? Wow. Okay. Well, I'm not going to be able to give you a full picture in the answer to this question, but I will talk to some of the points you raised. So. The conception of the human being as autonomous that you brought up is, some, is an image that has a profoundly sort of resonant ideal in, you know, broadly speaking, liberal societies. It's something that we tend to think of as being the fundamental ideal to aim for this conception of autonomy. Um, my view is that autonomy is important, where autonomy is understood as our ability to kind of critically reflect upon, think about, and possibly reject the kind of norms and understandings of our social context. But that we go wrong if we think that there can be such a thing as a fully abstracted autonomous individual, you know, on some Archimedean point somewhere who can just free herself from all of her restrictions and constraints. Because we're fundamentally social beings and we you know our preferences our understandings our way of understanding the world is fundamentally affected by our, our social context so autonomy is always within that context of a social um, a social milieu a social set of norms but what that means then of course is that what our society does and how our society treats us is fundamentally important and what we choose to do is itself affected by our social context and our social setting. So the kind of fundamental conclusion that I draw from that in, in other work, that's not my work on marriage, um, is that we, we go wrong if we think that the mere fact of having chosen something is enough to make that situation just or unproblematic, because we have to look at the context that leads us to make certain choices. And that's something that I explore um, in, in earlier work. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to give you any more on flourishing now. You have to come to a different talk about that another time. <laughs> Thank you. We look forward to seeing you at that. So there's a question. You. Have you got a microphone? Yeah, if we get the microphone there. And meanwhile, while, while that's coming, if I can do a question from online. Oh, yeah. So we've had a question. How would joint opting out provide protection to those in abusive relationships? Great, thank you. So joint opting out, I mean, as the questioner uh, suggests, there is a problem for people in abusive relationships, which may be that um, one person, the abusive partner, refuses to um, cooperate in a way that would protect the, the victim of the abuse. Joint opting out is supposed to be a safeguard because in order to, opt, I'm looking at you as if you're the questioner, yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, okay. um, because in order to opt out, um, that opting out process would itself need to be formalised, would need to go through some, um, perhaps through lawyers, where the lawyers are, you know, get, they get a bonanza there. So at the moment what happens is, you know, there is, there are, if you're an unmarried couple, there may be various ways in which you can get some kinds of protections by engaging in contracts or trust deeds or various kinds of agreements requiring, you know, legal expertise and know-how. What I I'm suggesting is that that onus ought to be on the people who want to opt out and therefore not have that protection from vulnerability. So the hope then is that the, the couple who go to seek a legal opt out are going to have to be confronted with the implications of that and there's that potential there for professional advice and safeguarding. So it's better in that sense than the situation now where you simply, if you have an abusive partner who refuses to marry you, you simply have no um, no way out of that problem. So, well, I, hope, I, hope, I think they're still watching. I hope they like the answer. We'll go up to the top there, then over here, then there was, um, and there's lots at the top at the moment, so we'll go over to you who are the first person I saw up here, and then we'll pick you guys up. 
Hi, um, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting and um, gave a lot to think about. Um, so I was brought up to think of marriage as like a huge and sacred commitment that you make to someone. And um, this kind of level of commitment, um, would you not say kind of the vows that you were talking about within the Common Book of Prayer and these kind of things, when they're backed up by something, um, a very real practical responsibility that the state is going to enforce, it adds to that sense of... Um, of commitment that you're making to that other person and don't you think that the fact that um, so when it says here we want to be miserable too in that kind of sense that they're they're, they're able to make that commitment that's also enforced with 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 I with all of the responsibilities at once that 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 is something special to say to that person like I love you that much or I want to be with you that much that I want to put everything behind that relationship if that makes sense thank you very much so yes of course um, Marriage is undertaken by many people as a deeply profound commitment, as you know, a sacred commitment potentially, but a commitment that they intend to keep permanently, and that can be for many people a fundamental part of marriage. The question is how and whether the state ought to get involved in that aspect of it. So generally speaking, um, the state will permit people to divorce, and I think that's the good thing, the right thing for the state to, to do. I don't think that, as we had a question earlier, that it would be right to make divorce more difficult. That's a real problem. So if the state's going to permit divorce, in what way should it back up this idea of marriage as a deep and profound commitment? Well, it could do so in a number of ways. It could do so by um, imposing very stringent um, requirements to demonstrate fault, as the earlier questioner had. It could do so by imposing fault-based alimony, where if you have done something to wrong the marriage, you have to pay significant amounts of money or compensation or maintenance to your former spouse. I think these kinds of methods are really problematic because they risk trapping people in abusive relationships. They risk um, making people financially um, seriously worse off for, for example, wanting to be out of a relationship or having an affair with somebody else. And they can create real problems of, of oppression and inequality. So I don't think that the state should really be getting involved in making it more difficult for people to leave relationships. That commitment, that sense of marriage as being sacred, I think has to come from the personal commitments of the people involved, not from the law. Uh, so we're beginning to run out of time. I've seen one question here, three up here. Um, is that it? Fantastic. So we'll do all of those, and if the questions can be brief, that will help. All at once. Uh, I'm going to do them separately. Uh, you hello. Um, uh, I wanted to understand, because uh, one of the main arguments, I think, uh, uh, thank you very much, it was very good, uh, um, is that the... Um, um, the state, um, when the state regulates something, uh, it stands on a sort of value, no? So um, the issue uh, I'm thinking is what that before uh, the institution of, of marriage, there are other values, for instance, equality or access for opportunities, mm -hmm. etc. No? Many, many, many other values. Um, what I'm thinking is that. If one of uh, one of your main ar arguments is that is that the when the state regulates something it stands on on some values, and you are going to be a uh, make a uh, marriage and uh, neutral, um, what will happen with the institutions when intermediate institutions, the church for instance, have their own meaning of marriage, and as 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 a state are you. Are you going to let them have whatever um, uh, definition of marriage that they want, or how are you going to regulate that? Great, thank you. Yeah, so certainly there are some underpinning values, which are the values of equality and liberty that I talked about, that I think are sort of the fundamental grounding values of liberal democratic societies, which are sort of bedrock of, of the argument. Um, in terms of religious marriage, there is a whole chapter of the book, it's the chapter that Julian likes the least, I believe, um, where I talk about exactly how the state ought to um, interact with and regulate religious marriages and the constraints that could be put on discriminatory um, marriage, marriages within religious and other groups. So I, I, I do have an answer to that, but I think I'm not... I, I, I like stop. it, I just don't quite agree with all oh, of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and to make things harder for Claire for that last comment, we'll take all three questions at once okay. um, and let you respond to I one. I have a pen. And we'll go from my right.
So, yeah, so it's you, you and you. Uh, my my question is going to be a bit of a time phraser because it was actually just paraphrased over there. So that ah. like, strike one off your list. Okay, even faster. Yes. Um, was the answer okay? <laughs> yeah, so. uh, I'm currently studying my English A level, and one of our set texts is Austen's Sense and Sensibility. Uh, reading Austen for me personally is what caused me to question my traditional views of marriage, and I just wanted to know for you personally, when do you begin to question the state and its definition of marriage? Oh, thank you so much. That's a great question. Oh, I, I can't answer. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, how would you feel about if the state's not recognising marriage, how would the state then recognise separation? Because if people have been cohabiting or living together for a long period of time, they would often share resources or share money or things like that. How would, how would the state be able to deal with the separation, say somebody ran off with everything? Thank you. Well, I can answer that one quickly. So um, if two people separate and they are happy with their agreements with how they separate things, the state doesn't get involved at all. The state only gets involved when there's a dispute and one person would go to, you know, to, to a family court, as now with a divorce, and say, this has happened, we need to use the regulations related to separation. So, so it wouldn't have to make a judgment in general about when a relationship began or ended, only in the question of dispute about a matter that there was a regulation. Um, the question about autobiography, thank you very much for that one. Well, um, I started working on this topic a really long time ago, um, and I know how long ago it was because when I started writing on this topic I didn't have any children, and now my oldest child is nearly 10. So it took about a decade to think about this. And when I started writing on this, I had this view that I'd taken from sort of feminism, that marriage was sort of necessarily oppressive to women. And I started to think about whether that was necessarily a permanent judgment or whether there were any reforms to marriage that could make it um, equal. And in particular, whether um, uh, what kind of, in what the oppress oppressiveness of marriage what, where it adhered, where it was, is it in the state, is it in the relationship, and so on. So it was through trying to answer that question, I thought I was going to write one paper on this simple question of why feminists oppose marriage and, you know, whether that will always be a problem. And, of course, it's never as simple as that, and it turned into, into the whole book. So, yeah, thank you. Well, it's been ten years of work, and I hope you'll yes. agree that it's been really interesting, very worth it. <laughs> um, and whether or not you've agreed with everything, I hope you'll agree it's been extremely thought-provoking. So, Claire, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you.